Yo estoy convencido que una de las tareas principales que tenemos los profesores en UPAEP no es solamente dotar a, nuestro, a nuestros estudiantes de conocimiento técnico o especializado, sino también incentivarlos a que practiquen esta cultura del encuentro, es decir, que se acerquen, que confronten eh, las diversas problemáticas eh, sociales que podemos vivir en nuestra localidad a nivel nacional o inclusive a nivel internacional. En este sentido, la iniciativa de la Escuela de Relaciones Internacionales en conjunto con el Grupo Estudiantil Hablemos en Serio, de generar un encuentro eh, solidario internacional con la Universidad Católica de Ucrania, pues tuvo este objetivo. No solamente eh, acercarnos de forma académica a la grave situación que hoy se vive con la invasión de Rusia a Ucrania, sino también generar este lazo empático con nuestros colegas, eh, profesores, académicos y estudiantes de aquella universidad para que nos platicaran su, su sentir, sus experiencias, su perspectiva de cómo viven los desastres de, de una guerra. En este sentido, yo quisiera eh, felicitar a, al grupo Hablemos en Serio, a Juan Antonio Yergo, a Sebastián Ursid, por haber hecho todo un trabajo de coordinación con universidades extranjeras, no solamente la ucraniana ya mencionada, sino también con una red de universidades católicas eh, de América Latina. A continuación, los estudiantes antes mencionados darán una introducción al video. El 24 de febrero de 2022, el ejército ruso, sin declaración previa, invadió Ucrania bajo las órdenes del presidente Vladimir Putin. Bajo un historial de décadas de tensión, este enfrentamiento ha sido un punto de inflexión para las relaciones entre el Estado ruso y Ucrania. Ante el conflicto, la cobertura mediática internacional que se le otorgó a la invasión estuvo centrada principalmente en cuestiones políticas, económicas y militares. Considerando esto, la Escuela de Relaciones Internacionales de la UPAEP, junto con el grupo estudiantil Hablemos en Serio, tomamos la decisión de realizar un encuentro universitario con estudiantes ucranianos. El objetivo de este encuentro era escuchar las experiencias y el sentir de la comunidad universitaria que está viviendo de primera mano la crisis en su país. A fin de fortalecer los vínculos interinstitucionales entre ambas universidades y con la participación de otras instituciones de educación de nivel superior pertenecientes a la red educal, los resultados de este encuentro podrán ser observados en el siguiente video. So, we welcome to this international solidarity meeting between Ukraine and Latin America. As you shall know, two months ago, the Russian army invaded Ukraine. This invasion has violated the accepted international norms of, of state behavior and moral codes. Without, without a doubt, The foundations of the post-war international system have, have been eroded. As an international relations scholar, I'm convinced that the, that the attack on Ukraine is not only an aggression against a sovereign country, but an attack against liberty, an attack against human rights, an attack against the welfare of a whole region, and is a threat to global peace. So regarding this context, I believe the university communities must get, must get interested in, in, in this fact. In this respect, I want to thank Professor Pablo Smith-Juk, Smith Irina Kitura, and Andriana Hammer of the Institute of Ecumenical Studies of the, of the Ukrainian Catholic University for allowing us to be part of the Solidarity Network in favor of U Ukrainians. So on behalf of the Social Science Department and the School of International Relations of UPAEP, I welcome our, our Ukrainian and Latin American friends with, with us today. This meeting aims to create and spread awareness among Latin American university communities about the negative implication of this invasion. But beyond that, the meeting aims uh, also to listen to and empathize with, with human beings who are getting across this crisis and fi find ways to, to help and support the Ukrainian people. Thank you to, to all of you. And I shall now pass the voice to, to Juan Antonio Yergo and Sebastián Ursid, who were the crafters of this meeting 
and who will conduct the, the participation of our guest. So, uh, adelante, Juan Antonio. Gracias, profesor. Bienvenidas y bienvenidos a todos los presentes. Good morning to the scholars, students, university communities, and general public here present. On behalf of the School of International Relations at UPAE and the College Student Group, Hablemos En Serio, it is with great pleasure that we welcome you to this international solidarity meeting between Ukrainian students and Latin American students. It is in times of uncertainty that our communities must create and strengthen the bonds between them. Today, as university students, we have the opportunity to do so by showing support to Ukrainian students. It is a relevant occasion to show that despite adversity, friends can be found all around the world. We are honored to be joined by our following guests. Dr. Dmitry Shenhoisky, Vice Rector for Academic Affairs and Internationalization at the Ukrainian Catholic University. Dr. Pablo Smaisny, Director of the Institute of Ecumenical Studies at the Ukrainian Catholic University. From their program Ethics, Politics, Economics, second year student, Andriana Hamar. First year student, Yelizaveta Tkach. Second year student, Roman Roshankivsky. First year student, Maria Stroich. And first year student, Shenia Andrusevich. Having introduced our respected guests, we now give the floor to Dr. Dmitry Shenhoisky to give us a brief introduction to what is going on in Ukraine. Thank you so much, uh, dear colleagues. It's a pleasure, and I will just to express my pleasure and the gratitude from, uh, from both, from Ukrainian Catholic University and also from Ukrainians for organizing such, such events and clearly now what is what is going on here in Ukraine. So definitely it's it's quite important to feel the, the hands of the international solidarity and uh, understanding uh, the ongoing war and understanding the preconditions and also the influence of uh, this Russian-Ukrainian war on the global community. Um, and to, moreover, what is critical right now is also to, to give a link between Ukrainian students, Ukrainian scholars with, with Latin American students and scholars to actually to create a path for solidarity, for help and support, uh, no matter what will be in the future. Uh, so I was asked here to, to give a few words on uh, the basics of, uh, of war, actually that uh, of the recent phase of war that has started at February 24th, and actually the, the preconditions that, that started in 2014. And uh, I, will, I will just probably stress on a few points uh, on that. And uh, if, you, if you have any questions or comments or, uh, or whatever, it's, I will be more than pleased to, to, to answer. And the first of all, we should understand that uh, any contemporary war is like, uh, very complex, any of them. So we can't take, and probably the majority of you are IR scholars and IR students or political science students, and uh, you definitely were studying different kinds of warfare through the human history. And uh, what is critical is that uh, the, the modern or contemporary wars, uh, it's right complex and you can't see only uh, one precondition that is influencing. So there is always a mixture, always a mixture. We can't see that it's only about economy or resources or some kind of ideology. It's, it's always a mix. And to think about the uh, Russian-Ukrainian war, it's also important to, to have and to, to have the understanding of different factors that were playing a critical role. So I just want to stress a few of them. I don't want to waste too many of your times because I you know students have the presentations and uh, they want to share their stories. But that is critical to understand that it both has different passes. So the first one, uh, we are witnessing uh, the big geopolitical ambitions of Russia. It is actually uh, Russia is showing after the collapse of Soviet Union. And uh, Mr. Putin several times told that for him, it was one of the biggest catastrophe that has happened in the modern world. So, and they did not recognize uh, 
the, the outcomes of the Cold War that was happening. So it was a tragedy. It was not like the, uh, for them, the, the possibility to rebuild their society. However, there were a few attempts in Russia in the, in the first years in the 19th, after Russia gained an independence. But this ability, so these possibilities to, to build a liberal democracy actually failed. And then come back to the vision, to the idea that it was it was a threat, that democracy is a threat and uh, the liberal world is a threat. And actually the outcomes of the uh, global conflict that they foresee in the Cold War uh, should, should be rethinked. And then come and brings us to the idea of the uh, more deeper understanding of present Russia or former Russia in the kinds of Soviet Union or in the kinds of, of uh, Tsarist Russia uh, about the imperialism. So in many senses, they have that feelings. Uh, we can't judge it by the sociology during the Soviet times because sociology never existed in, during the Soviet times, at, at least clear and recognized sociology. But what is happening here in Russia that's starting, especially after the resignation of uh, Boris Yeltsin, the former and the first president, and coming Mr. Putin to the power, uh, we definitely see that these imperialistic ambitions were always present for Russia. And it's clearly seen uh, during any conflict or any war that Russia was uh, a part of. I'm talking about both Georgian cases like in Abkhazia or uh, Southern Ossetia. Uh, we can also see it, uh, through the conflict of Transnistria uh, in Moldova, but also later conflicts and uh, in Syria or in any engagements where Russia, Russia took, took a part. So the imperialistic vision as an inability to build like the liberal society, but actually the tendency to, to build what they know very centralist state uh, is also one of the very important factors because uh, they bring us to the consideration. So what, what is the basis for these imperialistic ideas? And here we come to the uh, few elements of this imperialistic idea. The first one that you probably read in the newspapers, this is a vision of so-called Ruski Mir or Russian world. That actually is the combination, very strange combination of both uh, political ideas of Tsaris or a deeper state that is ruled by some authoritarian re regime or um, let's say authoritarian leader, but also the influence, the deep influence of religion on that, orthodox religion. And uh, I'll describe slightly the, the, the few uh, important points on that. Also the Russian language. So by that idea that is sadly, but what is coming from the Western idea of the uh, civilization, actually notion, the notion of civilization, so-called the separate orthodox Russian civilization that was bring to, uh, to the uh, global understanding by um, both Samuel Huntington and uh, other scholars that was brought by Russia to, to form the very, to their extent, rational narrative. So they were simply considering any part of the post-Soviet area uh, that uh, has a links with Russians and the majority of post-Soviet areas has, and, and states has these links with Russians. Uh, speaking of language, sharing the orthodox identity, religious identity, and also just being a part of the, of the former Soviet Union to be exactly the areas of influence for Russia. It was negotiated a few times and uh, the, first, the first most uh, prominent speak um, was actually, the speech was, uh, was made by Mr. Putin during the so-called and well famous Munich Forum before the Russian invasion to, uh, to Georgia to, in 2008. So here he proclaimed a danger of the Western liberal uh, values that could give a threat to Russian identity. So, and here we can see that to some extent the anti-Western doctrine or the anti-Western thinking and the thinking of uh, Russian world as a separate identity that had nothing in common with, with the Western world that was brought as a very powerful narrative. 
And so year by year, it was just strengthening, strengthened because it simply supported Putin's regime. So the idea of this, uh, all these narratives was, uh, can be definitely doubted by, by many of the scholars. And I think that uh, even Pavlo Smitsnyuk will give a, a few words about uh, the religious probably backgrounds on that, but it can be doubted. So it's just a scholaric field. But nevertheless, it was very strong and very influencing part that strengthening Putin regimes. And, he, and the main idea of that is, was just securing his regime. The second story in that in that kind is uh, actually ge geopolitical ambitions, because if you are a separate uh, country civilization, as they think, and have the spheres of influence, that simply means that you should have uh, the possibility to share your influence. So here we can see a conflict, direct conflict with the strengthening of NATO, and uh, actually of uh, crossing NATO closer to the Russian borders. So it was, it was considered by Russians as an external threat. It was not considered the possibility to secure the uh, European community, or let's say the North Atlantic uh, community to, to, to build the, the field or the sphere of security, but it was considered a threat. And I can directly tell you that starting from 2010, in every, in every military doctrine of Russia, there is a statement, there were a few emanations of this doctrine, that Russia is, uh, that uh, the expanding of NATO and strengthening of NATO, without mentioning what is strengthening of NATO, is considered to be the external threat to Russia. So geopolitical ambitions, also the narrative of so-called separate civilization that could not be understood by, uh, by the whole world and could be not understood by Western um, countries that actually build a platform for that. And why Ukraine? Because mainly Ukraine was a part of uh, the story. So Russia is appealing to the old historical tradition of Kievan Rus, then to the Tsarist Russia, to the Russian empire. And it was practically considering the lands of, uh, of Ukraine, even not the Ukraine as a separate country, but, but also but just lands of Ukraine to be a part of this Russian world, to be a part of this Russian narrative. Uh, also, there was much speculations about, about using of Russian language because Ukraine um, has official Ukrainian language. Uh, nevertheless, a number of Ukrainians, especially in the eastern part of Ukraine, speak Russian. So it was, it was just showing that, that uh, Russia has an influence. So it was also bringing the cultural so-called identity to, this, um, to, to that idea, to that notion. And everything was combined together. And actually, uh, the dramatic start of the Russian invasion uh, was happening during the so-called Revolution of Dignity, 2013 when uh, the power of uh, former president Yanukovych uh, was, was broken by the, by the Ukrainians. Uh, he, he made uh, several attempts, not only to stop uh, the moving of Ukraine to the European Union, but also to, to, made, to, strong, uh, to make stronger, to make safer his, uh, his tries to build the authoritarian regime, Russian type of authoritarian regime here, here, here in Ukraine. And uh, the danger of so-called, and geopolitically, it was also the period of different revolutions that were happening all over the world. So it was also the, some part uh, of the Middle East uh, revolution. So Russia was, and Putin regime was really threatened by the, uh, by the idea that it will come to Russia. So they should act immediately. And uh, that bring them in 2014, when actually we have the annexation of Crimea that they considered to be unlawfully a part of Ukraine. A separate and a long story, but nevertheless. And their uh, invasion to Donbass. What is, uh, I mean, Donetsk and Luhansk Oblast and building here are states, so-called states, independent states. So they usually uh, simply used that, that tradition that uh, they were using during the Georgian wars, the two Georgian wars. So simply the same, the same narratives and uh, simply the, the same logic. And uh, from 2014, 
they were simply trying to control these areas and they were trying to rebuild their thinking and also strengthen themselves. That stopped and prevented Ukra uh, Ukraine from possibility to enjoy um, major development because we were spending like mostly 20% of our budget on the um, war that was happening in, in the eastern part of Ukraine in Donbas area. So you can imagine that 20% of your budget simply simply crushed by war. And actually after that, there was a, a big danger uh, for them in 2021 when they started to actually to make a big deal with predominantly Western states. And when they failed, failed to make this big deal, it was a very unique chance for them to, to act. And this is geopolitical like explanation. Uh, the, um, the other point was that starting from the end of 2021, uh, Ukrainian economy started to run much more better than Russia, if we consider the GDP per, uh, per capita value. So simply what is mean that uh, if, if, you, if you see if you can compare by the Gini index, Ukrainians, uh, Russian society is um, is much more unequal than Ukrainian society. So their performance is much more better in terms of economy they had before war, the larger economy, but nevertheless, the life of citizens of Ukraine started to be much more better starting from 2021. So we reached uh, real growth, even despite the uh, war, even despite uh, the, the conflict that was in inactive phase, but it was in the uh, in the innocent part of Ukraine. So it was the unique moment of choice, the focal point for Russians or act or not to act. And now we see the, the results. So take into to account like the this focal point plus their ambitions, plus inability to make some deal about the spheres of influence with uh, mainly with the United States and with NATO uh, countries, with uh, EU countries, persuade them that this is a good chance to, to attack. And uh, the outcomes of these attacks we can see right now. So what is Russia doing here in the terms of warfare is actually what they were doing starting from uh, the every conflict, practically every conflict, every war that they engaged. Uh, first of all, it's simply uh, multi-dimensional war, uh, or how we call it, the hybrid warfare, because we can see that uh, we are fighting not only like on the land or in the sea or in the sky, but this is also the cyber dimension. Uh, this is also the dimension of economy. This is also the dimension of the um, of the end battles uh, in the criminal courts uh, towards uh, the what, what is called the law firm. So this is a complex, very complex thing. The other point of view, they if uh, they are combining both, both conventional war, so the natural, so called the classical war, but simply of the acts of terrorism by killing civilians, attacking cities, and uh, that's that's actually what they trained uh, during the Georgian war and especially during the Syrian war. So all these the combinations, if you look the the, so the history of these wars, and then you took the story of Ukraine, you can see the same attitude and the same approach to that. So currently, uh, what we see right now in Ukraine that due to the Ukrainian society, due to the Ukrainian army, and those transformations of Ukrainian army that happened since 2014 until now, and due to the support of other allies, mainly on the NATO countries. We restructured and rebuilt because we were, we proclaimed like after the revolution of dignity of a Euro-Atlantic pass. And we were transforming both civil society, our legislation and also our army according to the EU and NATO standards. And then we can simply see that Ukrainian army is much more effective than Russian army. That is full of unprofessionality, full of corruption, but they just being stronger in terms of the number of people, in terms of the number of the uh, missiles and the number of the weaponry, and also using terroristic approach, doing genocide uh, over Ukrainians and using terroristic approach that is nothing in common with the rules of war. 
so thanks to Ukrainian army, to Ukrainian society and the help of Western states, uh, you see that they, uh, they first plan simply to come and invade Kyiv in two days. So it was a massive ideological pass in order that they will simply come and, uh, and ruin everything and they will take Ukraine in two or three days. And it was much supported also uh, by the number of the Western academia and especially military experts who were counting the number of people, who were counting the number of weapons and came to the same conclusion. And that also inspired Putin to act, you know? So this is a danger also about the analysis and what academia can do in terms of the analysis. And, uh, but actually we were happy to see that uh, his plan A didn't succeed mainly because of the factors that I mentioned, and also because of the factor of inability of Russian army to, uh, to, to fight simply, because once more, they were unprepared. Uh, the number of professionals that were sent first, and uh, they see that um, their attacks are not succeeding, they were simply turned back, and simply uh, from the Russian part, the, uh, the people who, so there were not, not too many professionals who were fighting, I should admit, they were simply soldiers that even, some of them prove or say that they don't know that they are going to the, uh, to the war. So we, we can't prove it, we can't prove it. So because usually these this kinds of actions are, um, are really made by the, um, by the approval of, uh, of taking part in the, in the warfare, but nevertheless, so nevertheless, we can see that it was an ability of Russians to, to build successful strategy of, uh, of attack. So we came here right now to the plan B that is mainly focused uh, on Eastern part of Ukraine, the Southern part of Ukraine. So if they failed to invade Ukraine, uh, if they failed to do their plan A, so they will be trying at least to do something because it's just a, a point for strengthening of Putin regime. So we don't know how it will come to the end. Uh, we know some unofficial number of civilians and of Ukrainian militaries that are killed, but still the war is ongoing. We also know an official number of Russian soldiers that were killed, but once more, this is ongoing process. And the most dramatic here by now is two dangers. Dangers of continue, uh, continuation of the uh, missile attacks on Ukrainian cities, and you know that the number of Ukrainian cities are simply vanished, they're killed, people are killed, and uh, we also see the, the dangers of uh, the uh, genocide that has happened, uh, that is happening in the, in Kiev Oblast and also in Mariupol, and uh, I'm afraid we will see more and more of, of such, um, of such examples. And the second danger is the danger of long war. So it's coming to the phase of long lasting war. So that simply means that without the effective uh, collaboration uh, of Ukrainian army and uh, collaboration with other um, Western partners uh, that can provide us weaponry, it could be a long, very long war. And that simply means more deaths. So that, that I will stop because I was talking too much for that. And uh, uh, I just want to stress here that uh, it is very important for us right now not to, to finish this war as soon as possible. Uh, we are dreaming about our victory. We are ready to do this victory. But unfortunately, once more, uh, we can't compare Ukrainian and Russian uh, as a number of weaponry and people. So it's dramatically crit uh, critical to, uh, to, to unite and to, to do all the possible to actually to stop the war as soon as possible. And to stop the war, I, I simply mean winning this war. But it is important because once more, Russian imperialistic narrative will not end. If Russia prevails and keep the safe, it will not end. So we will face this more and more and more. And this is dramatical, not only for Ukraine, and not only for Europe, but also for the whole world. Because this is evidence that the power uh, can be justified. So if, if we will not win, it will simply prove that any state with authoritarian regime will have the possibility and the right to do what, whatever they want. And we will not face the, any um, 
or the global institutions or national institution ability to stop them, to prevent them. So that is why Ukrainian war is critically important to all the world. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dmitry Shenkoisky, for giving a very necessary introduction to the current situation in Ukraine. Uh, for an optimal, optimal dynamic, we ask our audience to make their questions at the end of our panel. Uh, we yield the word now to Dr. Pavlos Meisniu in order to share with us a few words with our audience before moving on with the Ukrainian students. Uh, hola, buenos dias. Uh, I'm very grateful uh, to Professor Ramirez Ortiz, uh, as well as to Juan Antonio and Sebastian for their uh, desire to uh, organize this uh, uh, solidarity meeting between Ukraine uh, and Mexico and other Latin American countries. Yes, and I know that there are people from Argentina, from Colombia, from many other countries. So thank you very much for your interest in what is going on in Ukraine. Uh, as Ukrainian Catholic University, we are both Ukrainians and patriots of our country, but we are also Catholics, uh, members of uh, a body that transcends national identity and where both Ukrainians and Latin Americans belong. So I would like just to say a couple of words about how this war became a challenge for the churches in Ukraine. Now in Ukraine, we have several Christian churches. The Catholics uh, are a minority. We have around 2% of Roman Catholics. We have around 10% of uh, uh, Eastern Rite Catholics uh, or Greek Catholics who are part of the Roman Catholic Church but have a different liturgy, different canon law, don't have celibacy for the priests, have another calendar. Yes, for us, Feliz Pasquas is uh, next Sunday and not uh, a couple of days ago. So, but we are uh, fully Catholic, of course. And there are two uh, Christian Orthodox churches. One is independent and one is linked to Russia. And we also have a vibrant Protestant community, Pentecostals and Baptists. So all of Ukrainian churches have condemned the Russian aggression of Ukraine and they have called for you international support of our country, call our people to defend our sovereignty. From the very beginning, Ukrainian Christians were dedicated to help those in need. As of today, more than a quarter of Ukrainian population, more than 10 people, were forced to leave their homes. Every fourth Ukrainian left their home. A lot of them went abroad uh, to other Eastern European countries, and many of them have been displaced in Ukraine. For example, the building of theology faculty at our university, part of it is now where refugees live. Uh, it's also a sign of ecumenical openness. Most people who are from Kyiv, Kharkiv, from Eastern Ukraine, where there are more bombardments, they would be Orthodox and they are hosted in Western Ukraine which is predominantly Eastern Catholic. Now, the biggest challenge for the church, I think in any time, but especially in times of war, is to remain church, yes, to witness to the truth, uh, avoid ambiguity, and to help those who are marginalized and suffering. And when, when we contemplate the tragedy of this war, when we see that the war is supported by 70% of Russian population, I think the natural temptation is to hate. And in this context, I find very important the call of the uh, major archbishop of Ukrainian uh, Greek Catholic Church who said, when we hate, we have been already defeated by our enemy. And it's not easy, yes, to fight the war and not to hate, but we try to do as we can. Unfortunately, the Russian Orthodox Church has been providing a theological justification of this war. The, 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 the chief of this church, the Patriarch Kirill, spoke about a metaphysical battle against the West, a war against the sinful West, resistance to gay parades, uh, which are a Western invention, etc. And this position has been sharply criticized by both Orthodox people in other countries and by 
ecumenical organizations. And many compare the position of the Russian Orthodox Church to that of German Christians who supported Hitler during the World War II. Now, we live in a world where everything is interconnected. And this is evident when we think of the ecological crisis of COVID-19 pandemic, of discussions against Russia, of, of sanctions against Russia, etc. As the first Latin American Pope, Papa Francisco, writes in Fratelli Tutti, we are a global community all in the same boat where one person problems are the problems of all. No one is saved alone. We can only be saved together. We are part of one another. And what I think is important today is that the churches and countries of Latin America can also feel their connectedness to what is going on in our country and their responsibility for Ukraine. And I believe this meeting is an expression of those feelings. I hope that universities, churches, NGOs, and governments in Latin America can feel united with Ukrainian people, may feel compassion and active solidarity, yes, as one body, one member of which is suffering, and not let Ukraine suffer alone. This can involve reaching out to your government, churches, businesses asking for pressure to be put on Russia to stop the war and to support Ukraine in any way possible. And I'm very grateful to those uh, students who will speak now uh, uh, and who will give their own accounts of what the university is doing in this difficult moment and how they are living this moment. As they say, no pasarán. So thank you for your attention and for hospitality. Thank you. We would like to thank uh, Dr. Pavlo for his valuable words. And now it is time to hear the voices of the Ukrainian youth. We yield the floor to our Ukrainian guests, Andriana, Elisabetta, Roman, and Maria. Andriana, you have the word. Uh, yeah, so uh, now we are going to share our experiences, to share our personal stories about how we feel, how we, how we think during this war. So I, will, I would like to introduce my colleague, uh, Lisa Tkach. Sorry, I see that I have a bad internet connection. I think that I was... You heard, yes? Everything is all right. Okay, so Lisa, please. Yeah, uh, thank you uh, for giving me a word. And uh, what I wanted to start with is, as uh, Dmitro uh, already mentioned, uh, unfortunately, the war in Ukraine did not start on 21st of February. Uh, it has been already going on for eight years since Russian troops occupied Crimea and invaded Luhansk and Donetsk regions, uh, which are at the eastern border of Ukraine. So for the last eight years, people there were living in a state of constant war. And for the last... Uh, eight years, uh, Ukrainian military there was protecting our no normal lives in the rest of Ukrainian territory. Uh, that's why uh, there is a project in our university called uh, Vertep to the East. Uh, Vertep is Ukrainian traditional uh, Christmas performance. Uh, the purpose of the project uh, was to bring a bit of holiday to these people who, unlike us, did not have the opportunity to celebrate in peace. Uh, I was a part of this project uh, this year, and we went uh, with a trip, uh, with this performance, to our um, eastern regions. Uh, Adriana, can you please show the map? Um, yes, here, uh, like uh, you can see the uh, Russian Ukrainian border, and like uh, red territory is one that was occupied uh, before uh, 24th of February all this time, 
and the blue one is uh, the uh, rest uh, territory of Donbass that uh, like is now the goal of uh, Ukrainian uh, troops but uh, we uh, traveled along the front line uh, to perform in front of our military who were there in front of civilians who lived there and uh, it was like an unforgettable experience uh, of uh, seeing those people finding happiness in little things those people being uh, super happy to see us their hospitality um, and like for example uh, seeing children uh, in front of who we performed there uh, they were seven eight years old like my younger sister and all they've ever seen in their lives was the war because they were born when it uh, already began um, and um, <laughs> what is uh, even more painful nowadays for me is to see all the news about uh, things happening in that region i mean all the little city little and big cities we visited there are now a bloody battlefield and um, i often see news saying that 80 percent of the cities i visited do not longer exist and um, it, it, it just doesn't fly in my mind but uh, unfortunately it is uh, the truth and um, on 15th of January this year, we uh, were in Mariupol, uh, a big, uh, beautiful, lively place back then, and heroic city that is hell on earth right now. Uh, on this map, yes, you, you can see uh, where Mariupol is uh, located, uh, like it is in the Donetsk region. And now Mariupol is facing blockade. Uh, it means that uh, nobody can uh, get in there to help people there and uh, no people can get out there to evacuate. It is uh, regularly being bombed, uh, including civil objects, including maternity hospital and uh, other places where civilians are just hiding and trying to save their lives. Um, also, uh, everyone who tries to get into the city to carry some humanitarian help or medical help or whatever uh, is being shot. Uh, Russian troops controlling the territory do not care if you're a postman, if you're a doctor, if you're whoever, you're going to be shot. So it is uh, really hard to help people there in any way. And the miracle happening there is that the city is still standing. Uh, most of its territory is occupied by Russians right now. Uh, there is a little piece still uh, controlled by Ukrainians. Adriana, can you show it, please? Yes, I try. I try. Okay. Uh, it is like uh, basically some something like just a bit bigger than uh, a building of um, a factory uh, and uh, uh, what 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 impresses me uh, the most is how people there are still not giving up uh, ukrainian military uh, all the red territory is controlled by russians and it's uh, white ones is the only piece uh, controlled by ukrainians right now um the military fighting there were uh, like uh, our president uh, told them that they could uh, get out of there if they feel like they cannot fight any longer and that, that we will manage this situation in some another way but they said no uh, it is our land here are our people and we will not give up on them uh, and we i mean all the ukraine are not giving up on them right now and we are helping with what we can and we are praying in hope that uh, like uh, 
as a justice wins, I guess. Um, like the last thing I wanted to say is that when I went to on on the trip on East, uh, one of my uh, friends from Western part of Ukraine asked me to start a blog or on or something like that so that I can tell uh, Central Ukrainians and Western Ukrainians what is actually going on there so they can learn about it. But uh, unfortunately, nowadays, there is no Ukrainian who has a privilege to learn about the war from someone else's words. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elisaveta, for your words. Uh, I would like to invite now Maria to share her testimony with the audience. Yes, hello everyone. My name is Maria. I and I study political science. Uh, also, I returned home to Ukraine less than a week ago from Poland, where I stayed for about a month. But before I share my experience, I'd like to show you a map of Ukraine so you can better understand where it is located and with which countries Ukraine borders. Andriana, can you share? Uh, yeah. Yes, so it's all uh, signed on the map, so I won't let Ukraine is yellow. Um, as you can see, unfortunately, we have a really large border with on the east with uh, aggressor country, terrorist country, Russia. And also, you probably know that bombing and shelling of Ukraine are also being carried out of the territory of Belarus. Uh, so if it's not all, also Russia previously occupied part of Moldova. So actually, the only like choice, the only option, and the op only relatively like safe uh, choice for Ukrainian to flee the country is Western border. And like some numbers, about 11 million of Ukrainian um, had to flee their homes, and 4.5 million of them fled the country. Um, and most of refugees go to Poland, and I was one of them. I went with my mother and younger brother because although I'm from western part of Ukraine, where is like the most safe place now of, in Ukraine, although like the, the whole Ukraine under the threat, but still everything is relatively um, so. Uh, but uh, the city officials advised us to move from the area where we lived because. We live next to the airport and it was already bombed twice. And so we never know if it's gonna be the third time or no, or, or just it's like and not the safest place there. So we left Ukraine, but we came back because we realized that um, like we can be refugees for forever. We have our home, like in Ukraine is my home, is my motherland, is my friends is everything that they have, everything that they love. And like, we are not ready to give up it just because Russia doesn't consider us as the people who deserve to live, as a nation who deserve to be alive. Like just as the people who, who want to be alive as the Ukrainian. Uh, so Andrana, you can close them up, I guess. Um, when we crossed the border like a month ago, um, we see um, thousands of women with small children and all they had was small backpacks. Some of them even didn't have the small backpacks because it's uh, people who lost everything they had. It's like now millions of Ukrainians who lost everything they had because just because they are Ukrainians and just because Russia doesn't consider us the people and uh, through the whole our history, they try to assimilate us to make us know exist to don't just um, don't just kill us but to make us russians to make us think that we are russians and uh, want to, what i want you to realize is that um, you can be neutral in that situation because it's not a situation it's not a geopolitical games anymore it's a war it's a genocide and like yes i came abroad and I'm in a safe place, but still war is inside you. And like you understand that it's a genocide in your country, in your nation, it, it could be me who laying in the mass grave, one of the mass graves on Ukraine 
it could be me raped and then killed and then tortured just because I am Ukrainian. So it's not the war for territory, but it's a war for values and just human rights on, on which the world function, at least we thought so until this whole scale and provoke bloody war started. Mm. We are fighting for democracy, we are fighting for freedom, we are fighting for, for the right for self-determination, and they are fighting for slavery and tyranny. So, um, so because we know what we are fighting for, we stay strong and we need now the world to stand with us. Thank you. Maria, thank you very much for sharing your testimony with with all of us. And now, Roman, uh, you have the word. Yeah. Okay, greetings. I would like to tell about my experience as a volunteer. I have worked with kids. I played board games. And uh, I would like to tell a story about how my first day has been. It was a long time ago compared to when war started and how it is now, but, but it's still a very important story. Because when I came into a shop, I have spotted a father and a daughter. Daughter looked very unfriendly and she didn't want to talk with no one. She didn't want to interact. She didn't want to play. She was very scared and had a bad opinion of surrounding. And it looked like something bad has happened. Her dad told that he had escaped, they have escaped from shelling, like there were a lot of bombs. They were forced to hide in the basement, and in the basement, they were very afraid and scared and have suffered some type of trauma. And um, they have to get on with it in life. And it's very sad. Another story about it is uh, one smoke talk with a boy and a mom, they talked about uh, their acquaintance and this acquaintance decided to return back to Kharkiv. It was around three or four weeks ago. And when the boy told mom this fact, mom said that it's insane, taking into account that Kharkiv suffers a lot from shelling, rocket attacks, and uh, it's a very dangerous place at the moment due to closeness to Eastern part of Ukraine. I, I believe it's all to those stories, which I find interesting for you, but another impression that yes, day was very ugly day because my day was disrupted. When I woke up instantly, there was a raid alarm and then there were news of rocket launches missiles have hit Lviv and I was very sad. I felt like everything is ruined. People have died, people have suffered, but I believe that Adriana can tell more about this nuisance and suffering. Well, thank you very much, uh, Roman, for, for sharing your experience as, as a volunteer. And Adriana, if you wish to share your thoughts on the situation, uh, you have the word. Um, yeah, like we're discussing in our group, if you really want to share, if somebody wants uh, wants to share the, the situation that was happening in Lviv yesterday. And um, I found out like in the evening that my father was uh, 50 meters uh, from the place where these rockets were launched and like um, near the place where there was a fire and uh, it's like very difficult to realize that my father could be injured and even not injured and he could be, um, you know, like, I'm not sure. It's like, okay, um, I have like different thoughts and I really want to share them, but they are very chaotic. So I will just tell what my father taught me and it's really impressed me. So he was like, uh, he was in the car, he was driving to his work, and he was in the traffic jam, because Lviv is a very small city, but there are a lot of people now, and um, 
So he was he was like um, sitting in the car, and in one moment he his car was like raced, and it was because of the shocked wave, shocking wave from the from this rocket, and uh, he was very afraid, and he went out from his car and he fell on the ground, uh, put his arms like there, and uh, a lot of people started to cry because they like. Every person like um, react differently, and um, he said that one woman just crawled down under his uh, car, and uh, he was just. My father was crying, uh, was 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 shouting on this woman because it can be very dangerous, and you know, like in this situation, every minute, every second is very precious. So he, he he just he just helped this woman to crawl out from 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 my father's car, and he was he was just lying on the ground, and he heard like this three three shots. They were very loud, and um, my father was very shocked. He is very um, his his man who 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 is not who doesn't like sharing his emotions, but it was like the first time, and he really. Uh, was stressed and uh, yeah and like he said that this uh, on this moment he realized what is really important in life yeah and uh, yeah this is like my father's experience and I just want to tell by this story my message is that now living in Ukraine you don't you do not know what will happen in five minutes and yes you can be in in safe but in fact you, you can be in in home and you don't know what can be in five minutes so yeah um so like the next block uh was about how how people how students can support uh, Ukraine so I will just uh, I was prepared I, I prepared some some options. So um, I will I will share in the chat um, a link. It is the website that was created by Ukrainian Catholic University, and you can find there different uh, projects and different different projects that were made by the students of our university. It is mostly volunteering projects that help refugees, that help to protect, that help to gather some things to protect the lives of our uh, soldiers. Um, this is the project um, of some informational campaign. And also on this site, you can find like official bills on which you can donate your money in order to help to help Ukraine. Uh, you know that now Ukraine is on the very difficult phase and this way can be even harder than it was before. Um, and now our soldiers are fighting very, very hard on the east of Ukraine and on the south of our country, uh, as Lisa said in Mariupol. Uh, so like even the financial help is also very important for us. Also, um, it is as as Maria said, it is also very important for us not to, to, to feel the support. So we ask you not to be indifferent and really to share different information about Ukraine because the world like should not forget about what is really happening in Ukraine. Uh, also, if you have some possibilities, please help refugees. I know that you are you are much much far from us, but I still believe that maybe there are some Ukrainians that need this help. So uh, I think they will be grateful. And uh, also, if you can, you can influence your government. Like political support for Ukrainians is very important. And uh, also, uh, join rallies. Like uh, go out. Like go to the centers of your cities. Please tell about Ukrainians. Um, yeah, and uh, also um, it is important for me that Ukraine, it, it is important for me to, for you to understand that Ukraine is just not about the country of suffering and, and, and all the tragedies that we have now and had before in our history. Ukraine is also a country of a very beautiful culture. So please, if you have like time, you can 
Um, you can watch Ukrainian films, you can find out about Ukrainian artists. Uh, like this, this, this will help you just to, to, to understand Ukrainians better and to understand maybe how, how this nation is beautiful, yeah. So these are some options of support and maybe it can be useful for you. Um, yeah, just what I think can be, um, can be valuable for us. And also you can organize some humanitarian aid, but in fact, it will, be, it will take a lot of time to deliver it to Ukraine. So it's better just to, to, to I don't know, maybe to help some organization that, also, that already works in your country, or maybe just to, to donate some money in order to help Ukrainian volunteers buy something in Ukraine or in other countries. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Andrea, and thank you again, Elisabetta, Maria, and Roman, for sharing your experience with all of us. Uh, we believe it is important for us to know the experience of the people that have lived firsthand with the situation and to actively show our support as well. It is in difficult times when we must be solidarity with those who are experiencing the situation, and we would like for this to become an opportunity for other universities and students to manifest their support to the people of Ukraine. Joining us for the occasion, let us introduce our Latin American guests. Yes, Juliet Cristina Elsate Gomez, student at the Universidad Católica de Oriente in Colombia. Manuela Castro Díaz, a student at the Universidad Católica de Oriente in Colombia as well. Macarena Aranzazu Barrondo, a student at the Universidad del Salvador in Argentina. And Nicola Alexandra Terraza Santander, a student at the Universidad Católica Boliviana San Pablo in Bolivia. Having introduced our guests, we yield the floor to Juliet in order to share a few words with our audience. Adelante, Juliet. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, today, now let and freedom are under attack. Our siblings in Ukraine are suffering around the world. And this is a message of hope to all our colleagues that are all over the world. And in spite of violence, in spite of tyranny, in spite of hunger, in spite of war, we humans as the phoenix can rise to a child, a greater good for all of us. As Gandhi said, be the change you wish to see in the world. And I know that you are the change we need. Because when we reach our hands to others in order to help, we create an unbreakable chain of hope. And that hope is what will stand against the horrors of the who seek to destroy. As Colombians, we know the suffering of war, the damage of the church of power, broken families, friends that we will never see again, brilliant minds that left this wonderful planet before their time. Is that deserve to lead uh, in Fridmont, free, free but were taking taken away. We feel in what in one in one a heart your pain and your pain. Pain that we wish nobody else has to suffer. That is why we extend our hands to you as siblings. We know the, the atrocity of violence. But the future will grow as the fields on some flowers under a blue sky. It will be as in eternal spring in, in our hearts, where Friedmont Lord now links as the ones of the compassion to each other will try a new port that left 
us reveal our world. Yes, there will be dark days. Yes, it is not going to be easy, but the hot and idle that run through our, uh, our hearts will give us the strength to stand up and prosper for what we love. Dear colleagues of Ukraine, be strong and keep your head up. Never surrender to the horrors of tyranny. Let the freedom run drown your spirit. Here we rise, our hopes uh, for a better future for you, for us, for all. Slava Ukraine. Muchas gracias, Juliet, por tus profundas palabras. I would like to invite Manuela to take the floor. Por favor, Manuela, adelante. Thank you. Good afternoon, guys. The Argentine singer Mercedes Sosa composed a song called Solo Le Pido a Dios. And in it, she tells us what we should be and do in times of war. I think it's a call for all of us for the countries that see what's happening in the world around this war, that it should become what we all live through. Parts of the lyrics say, I only ask God that the unjust isn't indifferent to me. I only ask God that the war isn't indifferent to me. It's a big monster and it comes on, and yes, it is. It's a big monster that attacks us all, that must call us to act. In Colombia, we know what injustice means, and we have also experienced war for many years. We have known what fear is, but also the power of the people fighting for what they love, what belongs to them. Jorge Eliezer Gaitán, defender of the popular causes and a victim of Colombian intolerance say, the people are superior to their leaders. And we encourage you to do that. Continue fighting and loving what is yours. Our countries represent our home, identity, family, and all of that deserve to be respect and value. Sadly, we haven't known a language different from violence because that's how we were colonized. However, you must know that what makes you strong is not war per se itself. It's the word pronounced to defend what you love and that is your nation. War isn't a cause for celebration, but there's something good when it responded to out of love for what belongs to us. Our community of Universidad Católica y Oriente and the Colombian people are with you all. Thank you. Agradecemos tu mensaje, Manuela. Macarena, you have uh, the time now to share your thoughts with the audience. Thank Adelante. you. Well, good afternoon to all those present, especially to the Ukrainian Catholic University students and teachers, those who summon us today on behalf of their people. As a university student, I wish to accompany them in this critical and conflicting moment. And beyond political positions, I am with them with the spirit of union, of containment, of looking forward to the future in pursuit of a panorama of fraternity among all peoples, from the values that are inculcated in our universities. I join you from my humble place with the words of Pope Francis, wishing peace and tranquility to all the Ukrainian people and world peace to think ahead and work for much a better world. I thank the organizers for the opportunity to be in these kind of spaces, to know in a first person how it is to go through a war conflict and how it is to go through life the day to day in such a complicated and painful situation. The union of people makes life go on in spite of everything and above all makes distance and loss less painful. My support goes to the students who despite the impediments continue to study and improve themselves, trying to live in a less conflict ridden world. I deeply wish that the conflict will end as soon as possible, allowing those Ukrainians who are currently refugees in the rest of the world to return to their country. Let us pray that the times of peace will return and that they will once again become the nation that they are together and with the fraternity they have had until today. 
thank you so much to the teachers and the students to share us uh, all this situation and and let us to see how is to be to be there. Muchísimas gracias, Macarena, por el detalle con nuestros compañeros en Ucrania. Finally, we would like to hear the words of Nicole. Thanks, dear friends. I'm very happy to see you and share the virtual space with you. Today, I want to call for peace and unity among all of us. I'm sure that every single person here is supporting Ukraine and its citizens, I'm sure. And the whole world has prayed for the end of this and all the wars that have taken place in the last decade. Despite the geographic distance between all of us, our hearts has united in one voice to say, peace for Ukraine, stand with Ukraine, and pray for Ukraine. This phrase, or these phrases, have sent a message of hope and faith to our Ukrainian brothers and sisters. From Bolivia, many of us have sent messages of support for Ukraine through our social networks. And I want you all to know that you are not alone. Your courage, love, perseverance, and patriotism are reflected in your beautiful national anthem, which I love and I wish to learn to sing in your native language someday. The verse that touched my heart and I always keep my, in my mind is where the spirit of Ukraine shines and lives forever. Despite the adversities you are going through, never lose your faith, never lose your smile, and above all, do not lose your dreams. Ukraine, beautiful people who are showing the world how unity will lead them to independence and freedom. From the Bolivian Catholic University, we wish to express all our support and solidarity to the Ukrainian community. I'm sure that the sun will shine again. Stand strong. Glory to Ukraine. Slava Ukraine. Thank you, Nicole, for sharing your message with our Ukrainian guests. Finally, we will take the freedom to give some words ourselves on behalf of the Universidad Popular Autónoma del Estado de Puebla in Mexico. As inhabitants of the same planet, as human beings, and even more so, as members of university communities throughout the world, it is our duty to show support to those who are facing the crisis in their own country. We have a moral responsibility to speak out when our fellow colleagues are being victims of a unilaterally caused international injustice. Us, there is a bond that unites us beyond borders. As a youth of the world, we've been called to build bridges between communities. And it is precisely the responsibility that has led us to meet in this international solidarity meeting. The words of Juliet, Manuela, Macarena, and Nicole share the same message of unity and fraternity that must prevail in our generation. Friends and scholars from Ukraine, we keep you in our hearts. The spaces like this are essential to expand these interinstitutional bonds and to express our support in situations as, as complex as the current one. Remember, you're not alone. You have plenty of people supporting you despite the distance, the difficulties it entails. Through your experiences and feelings in the past couple of weeks, it is possible for us to get closer to the reality and seriousness of the situation. So we truly appreciate your time and effort to be here today. Let us undertake concrete actions that allow us to spread the values of solidarity and mutual support. In our contemporary world, there are multiple means by which we can act proactively in favor of others. Let us be embraced by the hopeful friendship that can emerge from this meeting. And may this event not be reduced to a simple interinstitutional exercise. On the contrary, let us demonstrate inside and outside our communities the gift of human solidarity in service of our world. To our friends from Ukraine and Latin America, we're infinitely grateful for your presence. We deeply hope that this panel is just the beginning of friendships that transcend borders. And before closing this event and allowing the audience in case there are questions, we would like to hear some final thoughts by the director of the Institute of Ecumenical Studies at the Ukrainian Catholic University, Dr. Pablo Smesink. 
Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and I just would like to thanks uh, to express my thanks for your uh, interest in what is going on in Ukraine, uh, to thank you for uh, your courage, uh, uh, for your kind words. Uh, and uh, I hope this can be really a step uh, for uh, a better understanding uh, between uh, Ukrainians and uh, Latin Americans, uh, uh, between our students and faculties. Uh, I think that um, with uh, your experience of uh, both uh, wars, uh, civil wars, uh, conflicts in many countries, yes, uh, of violence, I, I was thinking about Colombia, uh, about uh, Venezuela, about Chile, about many other countries that we would need your experience and, uh, when we will also uh, try to deal with reconciliation, with approaches to victims, to memory. So I hope that this cooperation can, uh, can uh, be uh, expanded upon and that we will find ways also to learn from uh, the huge experience of uh, conflicts and conflict resolutions and reconciliation from Latin America. So, uh, muchas gracias a todos ustedes. We yield the floor to Dr. Dersu Daniel in order to share some final thoughts uh, for this meeting. Uh, Professor, adelante. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Lisa, Maria, Roman, Andriana, Pablo, Irina, Dimitrio. Thank you very much for this opportunity to listen to you. It was a privilege. For us, it's very important to, to keep in, in touch. Uh, as I mentioned before, as students and professor of higher education, I think we, we are responsible for understanding and, and analyzing this kind of the scenario. And I totally agree with Maria when she said that uh, we, can, we can be ne neutral in this, in this kind of situations. We are responsible for criticizing uh, unjust actions and oppressive political, political decisions. In, moment, in, moment, in moments like, like this one, I believe we are called to be accountable for building solidarity and supporting mechanisms. So I truly hope that this meeting will begin a, a longstanding uh, friendship and collaboration between, uh, between our academic communities. And finally, on behalf of UPAEP community, we send you and your families blessings and best wishes. De verdad, muchas gracias por estar con nosotros. Thank you, Dr. Dersu. Uh, it seems that there is no questions at the moment, so I think we shall proceed with the closing of this event. So, Sebastián, adelante. On behalf of the School of International Relations at UPAEP and the college student group Hablemos En Serio, we thank you all for your presence. Especially, we thank the students from Latin America and the students and scholars of the Ukrainian Catholic University. Gracias. Y agradecemos a todos por su atención y que tengan una excelente semana y en estos más profundos abrazos para nuestros amigos en Ucrania. Hasta luego. Well, thank you, uh, people in, in Ukraine. Thank you, Dr. Pablo. Uh, it's been a great opportunity to have a chat with you. And we sincerely hope that this meeting served its purpose and to show our support and solidarity, even if we are separated by miles. And also we would like to thank, of course, the students because uh, we as students are aware of how many things you have to do, not just college stuff, but everything else. So we really appreciate the time and effort for you to be in here. Thank you very much. Pues finalizamos así y Martín, si nos puedes apoyar finalizando la llamada, te lo agradecería. Muchas gracias. Eh? Gracias. Buen día. Estamos gracias. en contacto. Estamos en contacto. Hasta luego a todos. Hasta luego.